Giorgio Nino. On va parler français ou italien ou en plutôt anglais, je pense. Donc, uh, so Nino Tocchetti is uh, from uh, Milano, uh, well known uh, in the world of neurointensive care uh, and uh, going throughout the world to uh, discuss uh, this issue of uh, brain injury. And uh, today it will be a uh, neuroprotection. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> neuroprotection is a big title. It's very ambitious. I would be proud of saying that I can protect the brain. And you will see it during my presentation that I can't. But just to start with something solid, when there is an ambitious goal to hit, we better go to the literature and look for strong data. So let's go to Asterix, that to me looks like Didier Payen lecturing. So I see the same histrionic attitude And you can put myself or Giuseppe into the Romanian who is bumped by the strong Gallic hero. But it's a published paper that I did enjoy because it's quite scientific. And the authors went through 39 numbers of asterix and they counted the traumatic brain injuries, 704. And in almost 500, uh, there was a helmet. And in just one case, the magic potion, which should be the real protectant, was used. So that gives me the opportunity of really trying to define what neuroprotection is about. Because uh, the proper uh, definition of neuroprotection should be something like this helmet that can reduce the neuronal damage, the neuronal death or degeneration, and uh, which can act by interrupting the pathways leading to the brain tissue damage. But I think that in clinical practice, there is also another concept of protection. If you can stop the legionnaire in beating, so if you can reduce the rate and the amount of insults, you are still protecting is, of course, less noble, is not as um, eye sounding like the real neuroprotecting compound, but it may work. So today, I would like to go with you through these two concepts. How can you protect uh, preserving tissue and function, or can, how can you protect reducing the burden? So let's uh, summarize where we are in terms of high-level neuroprotection. We are in very bad shape. And I think it, it is because of three main issues. Because the animal models uh, were very successful, but they didn't translate in successful trials, perhaps because of the design of the trial or beca because of the time window. We expected to have, let's say, eight hours after the injury to start randomizing the patient. Perhaps we were not right. And not to depress you too much, I have put in yellow on the right column uh, options still open. We are still looking for reparative strategies by stem cells, and there are promising work on this. Sex hormones, you will see there is something coming, pre-conditioning or after conditioning, and perhaps hypothermia. But the next two slides are tables saying what has been proven not to work. So these are the demonstration of failures. And it starts in something published in 1987, and it goes uh, up to the last years with the dexanabinol trial. In all these cases, the compounds, which were thought to be quite protective in the lab, didn't work. So that is the David Menon uh, summary, uh, very powerful drugs and compounds in the lab with very good data supporting its uh, use in the clinical practice and failures. And I have two more bad news to give you. The first is there were two uh, trials with progesterone. One is still uh, uh, waiting for uh, data, and we think we will close, we will lock the database in May. So perhaps we will have this data available before summer. But concurrently, there was another NIH-sponsored NIH trial Uh, by David Wright, and the trial has been stopped for fertility, meaning that the external committee reviewing the data concluded that there was no 
really evidence of potential benefit so that the trial has been shut down. Moreover, hypothermia. Schumacher was in hypothermia. And uh, I was thinking of Jean-Francois doing his best to control ICP on him, of course. But we don't have data on hypothermia. We don't have, let's say, uh, convincing data. And this <laughs> horizon, already very blue and very bad, is becoming darker. Because this is a trial in children, very well done, and guess what? Stopped for futility. And uh, I would like just to justify a little bit the community, because I know m many of these guys who are trying to do these trials. Look here. From November 2007 up to February, end of February 2011, multicenter, very big trial, 77. It's difficult to make this trial. If you are really careful and you select properly, mainly in children, the numbers are really very, very low. I think that we have an additional problem. So let me, I like that, to be against the flow for a moment. It's fashionable to say we do need big trials, bigger trials, mega trials. And uh, this is the starting point, that was the starting point for steroids. Among the few things that we were aware of were that steroids didn't work. But looking at the literature, if you look at the diamond, which summarizes the evidence in favor or against, fav or against the benefit for steroids in traumatic brain injury, a British guy, very careful, looked at this edge, which touches the line of equity. So the conclusion was, perhaps, that it may help. Of course, immediately, other colleagues published a letter saying, mm -hmm, you are wrong, because if you do carefully your calculation, the diamond stays exactly on the no benefit, no possibility for benefit uh, line, but despite that, a mega trial. More than 10,000 patients enrolled. And it was really a big effort with 48 hours of corticosteroids or placebo, leading to the strong conclusion steroids do not help, they do harm. So treated patients did much worse than the, treated, the untreated one which is very bad, but you knew, we knew that before. But that is the provocative part of my talk. Please look at these three CT scans. This is TBI. But I challenge each of you to believe that this patient is similar to this one, or worse to this one. This is an extradural hematoma compressing the brain. You do surgery, and the brain probably is still in very good shape before below the hematoma. So you may do something very good. On the contrary, on the extreme right. Diffuse axonal injury. If you look here, this is the corpus callosum, is fractured. There was so much energy that the axonal fibers have been disrupted. There is no surgery capable of reconstructing the integrity of this tissue. And look at the contusion here, in the middle. What is contusion about? Contusion is inflammation. Are you aware of a more powerful anti-inflammatory drug than steroids? I am not. So perhaps that putting all together and trying to test steroids for surgical, non-surgical, diffuse axonal injury, we lost the opportunity of finding something that could be work. So let's take it open. And now, let's focus on the second possibility that we have. So we don't have the magic potion, for sure. But we can do something to reduce the burden. And that is a very simple concept that I think it's very well uh, accepted between us. We better make it clear to the politicians because it's, it's, it's again, um, it concerns organization. 1982, published 1984, but the data are a couple of years before. In uh, is Nadia here. So it's in, a, in a region of Italy, so, which is Verona, mortality dropped impressively. It was the major neurosurgical center in this area of my country that comes from the Alps, so the mountains, down to the uh, flat land. And at that time, there were very bad connections by uh, roads. So what happened? The highway. So a highway has been constructed, and Verona published 
that the mortality, and in fact also the morbidity, dropped impressively. I am saying that the highway can be neuroprotectant. I am crazy, but not totally crazy. Simply meaning that if you reduce 13 hours as a minimum before surgery for an extradural hematoma, hematoma to a couple of hours, you protect the brain because you prevent further insult. Why that is important? Because that was 30 years ago, but it is not that old. This is Europe and <laughs> USA and Australia. Just 100 centers, but we are talking about more than uh, 11,000 patients. And this is the percent of TBI uh, who arrive to the neurotrauma center directly or through a first hospital. Sometimes first hospital, second hospital, and then the final one, which is, of course, no sense. Please look, how can that happen? And you may say, okay, Netherlands is a tiny country, so it's easy to speed up communication and to send the patient to the right place. But if you look at the UK, you can't say that the UK is bigger than Spain. The issue is organization. If you are well organized, the right patient goes to the right hospital soon. If you are disorganized, that doesn't happen. And you see that more indirect transfer means delays. That is the time that is necessary to reach the final destination. So losing time is not neuroprotectant, gaining time is. What about before arriving to the hospital? We were used to measure the patients on arrival on the ER. When we got helicopter, we went to the highway, taking measurements on pressure and oxygen saturation on the spot in the highway. And the percentage were like that. 60% of patients at the scene with the saturation, so hypoxic, and one patient in four, hypotensive. So you have the helicopter, you have the doctor, you do something good. And these are data from the USA suggesting, please check the difference between having both hypotension and uh, hypoxia or not having either of these two um, problems. Mortality, 27 or 75 is three times. Is that true today? With Giuseppe and Luigi, we are at three different, uh, different ages in the Milano area, we collected 700 patients. Just looking at simple things like hypoxia and hypotension, I, I don't have the time to define precisely that, but if you look at the pies, you see that there is still a proportion in a quite civilized area of patients with hypoxia and or hypotension, and that is associated with worse outcome. Of course, Today is 2014. We can't accept this kind of association. It's very primitive statistics. So let's do a little bit of high-level statistics, at least decent statistics. So let's adjust the data for the severity. So we are comparing more or less the patients on the same ground. Still, you see that the all ratio, the probability of uh, having a very worse outcome is around two times if you have this kind of problems proving that we still have something that we have to take care of. Big data. Now we are moving up to thousands of patients, almost 10,000. Again, the data are clear. If the patients are alive, hypoxic or hypotensive, really, the chances of good outcome are very bad. And my final point is about what we do every day in the ICU, because we are still trying to, to do something protective, at least reducing the extent of damage and insult that the patient received. This is a Norwegian paper of a colleague who went to San Francisco to learn something, and he went back to his country and promoted the concept of the intracranial hypertension dose. So he is saying that we can try to quantify not just how high the ICP goes, but how long this uh, raised ICP continues. I think it's an intelligent way of quantifying the burden. So you see, you say that 20 could be acceptable. You may debate about that, but let's say 20 is good. It's not good, is the threshold for being really active. Then you can quantify the total time and extent of ICP burden. 
and these are the data. You see the proportion of patients who suffered moderate or high dose of ICP, and what happens is that by simple association, the patient with high dose, this is the proportion between bad or favorable outcome, and you see that the proportion changes impressively. Again, very basic statistic, but just to give you the idea that it may mean something. With Giuseppe and Luigi, again, we put together 400 patients look at refractory intracranial hypertension, and here you have the patient split this way. Uh, we were very good in controlling ICP in those. Not perfect, but acceptable here, very bad here. More than 30 average. It's a disaster. And what happens to outcome? Here, 70% home discharged home after the hospital independent. Favorable for us is moderate disability or good recovery. And here, 11%. Again, is an association, but the association is quite strong and it leaves open the question if ICP is something that we have to take care of. Of course, I think we should, but in these days, there are many discussions about that. As a matter of fact, in the last 30 years or 40, mortality goes down. Uh, this paper says that it goes down either in centers a little bit lazy where they don't do so much, or in very, in very active centers. But, of course, the best results, if you are very active, if you do ICP, if you treat your patient according to some uh, measurements. And this paper by Esther Lintzma, uh, she is a statistician, a clinician, a clinical statistician, is based on data on many centers, and it says that you can have good centers, or bad centers. And the differences for mortality, or let's say unfavorable, can be three times. So depending on where you are, you may have three times more probability of uh, dying or having an unfavorable outcome. Which means, let, let's be positive. If you are a good doctor, you can do something good. Let's uh, look at the position positively. And uh, the final point I would try to make is what makes a good doctor? What makes a good ICU, a good unit? All papers that praised different religions. Four papers saying that CPP should be kept very high, and in Lund, CPP should be low. And uh, in uh, Houston, uh, look at CPP but use hyperventilation, or in uh, uh, Philadelphia, look at CPP and push hyperventilation, and in Milano, what I have shown you before. So look here, these are the patients, not big, serious, Lund especially 50 patients is not enough to make a revision, but anyway, what I would like to have your attention on is the last row, favorable, 59, 60, 74, 59, more or less the same proportion of patients with favorable outcome. How can we reconcile the fact that Didier was saying CO2 push down, disaster. I, I am not in agreement with it, but anyway, that is, could be very dangerous. So we use something poisonous, something dangerous. We have a high CPP and we have a low CPP, and that is the rate of favorable. And I trust these colleagues. I think that the data are credible. Look here. These are not the differences. These are the similarities among these centers. Oxygen, no hypotension, airway protection, early surgery, frequent CP, and etc. I am proposing that what really makes a good unit is not the religion, is not the fact that uh, Didier likes uh, transcranial Doppler, I do, but perhaps someone will not like that, but is, that is not the difference. It's not about the concept. It's about the package of care. So let me conclude that we don't have the magic potion, for sure. We have something, not that much, but we can do really something useful if we reduce the insults. And in reducing the insults, we should be very humble. It's not the, really the brilliant concept that makes the difference is you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.